Welcome back everybody and I am going to hand over to Emma Harding. Good afternoon everybody. Um, it's well it's lovely to see those of you that I can see. I have lots of other things on my screen. Um, so this afternoon I'm going to be yeah. talking to you. Oh gosh. Um, about the context of familial harm to children. Um, so Julie has already touched on this in her previous presentation, but I'm going to focus on this far more in my presentation today. So as we've already talked about, the Child Safeguarding Practice Review Panel Invisible Men report highlighted a number of contextual factors that were present when infants were harmed by their fathers by way of non-accidental injury. Um, and page seven of the review identified the significance of men who had a background of abusive, neglectful or inconsistent parenting themselves. Next slide, please, um, Lisa. So these experiences led to poor mental health, which was often exacerbated by substance, drug and alcohol misuse, especially the use of drugs, which can affect sleep, mood, emotional and behavioural regulation and decision making. The coexistence of domestic abuse, with some men minimising their difficulties with others through a rapid default to violence and control in behaviour. Could you click, please, Lisa? And then in addition, living with daily pressures such as poverty, debt, worklessness, discrimination, and in several cases, very problematic relationships with the mothers of the, their children. It's important to stress that these factors were present at the time that the children were harmed. However, it cannot be said that they were the direct causes of the non-accidental injuries. Next slide, please. OK, so um, what we have for you today is a quiz which contains eight questions relating to the factors of parental mental health, parental drug and alcohol misuse and domestic abuse and their impact on children. So what I'd like you to do is follow the link that Corinne's just popped in the chat or the QR code on screen, answering each question, um, taking your time to think about what you think the answers may be, pressing submit at the bottom. When the results are submit, you can please, you can press view results to see the detailed answers to those questions. So I'll just give you a few moments um, to complete that. Okay, we have 17 responses so far, so some of you have done that really, really quickly. Not that it's a competition because it's not. <laughs> okay, don't worry, Jeanette, we will um, be having a, a brief look at the responses um, so that you can see those answers and the um, questions and answers will be available after today. Oh, we've got it, great. Oh, lovely, 51 responses. So I know that's not everybody, um, but I'd wonder, Lisa, if we could just move that because we do have time onto the screen just to see how people have responded to those questions. And I won't go through each one, but I will just highlight um, those that maybe um, were not necessarily answered correctly just in terms of raising awareness. So those of you that are still working through it, you'll get some of the answers now as we work through, um, but I'm just conscious of time. So, for example, the first question we've got around mental health problems are more prevalent in parents than the general population. Um, that's actually false. Um, so there are one in four people in the general population who will experience mental health problems at any given time and the prevalence of mental health problems in parents is no different than in the general population although some studies suggest that rates of depression and anxiety can become elevated during the perinatal period um 
Okay, so um, and parents with severe mental health problems are not able to understand and attend to their child's needs. Okay, so yeah, that is false. Um, mental health problems can substantially reduce a parent's capacity to understand and attend to their child's needs, which can in turn impact on a child's development. And studies show that parents with severe mental health problems are more than twice than likely to neglect their child. However, this risk depends on the nature and sever severity of the mental health problem. And it's important to highlight that risks can be mitigated when there are, there are adults available to meet the child's needs. If we could just have a look at the other one, Lisa. So this one, um, risk to children only when parents are dependent on alcohol or drugs. Um, th there's a high proportion of those of you that have, have identified false. And as I say, you'll get the answers to that. Um, which I won't go through each one because I'm conscious of time. Just picking up on number five, um, being abused by a family member as a child has a greater negative impact on a child's development than witnessing abuse. Um, I think it's important to highlight here that it has it, it, it's false because it has a comparable impact on a child. So on average, witnessing domestic abuse in childhood more than doubles the risk of serious adult mental health problems and triples the risk of that child becoming either a victim or a perpetrator of domestic abuse. So which is why it's so important that the Domestic Abuse Act has recognised children who um, experience and witness domestic abuse as victims. Um, so again, number six, we've got that largely true and number seven, largely false and also number eight. So as I said, you'll have you should be able to see all of the answers to those questions. Um, I think overall we, we did pretty well. So thank you for that. Um, and as I say, you should be able to see those after after today. Thank you, Lisa. So I just wanted to highlight now wider research. So moving um, to more widely, looking beyond um, the myth of invisible men report, wider research has recently been conducted by the Early Intervention Foundation, which was produced to support the response to the recommendations for the recently published independent review of children's social care. The uh, link to the report is contained within the handouts that um, you've had for today. Um, and this research argues that whilst it is important to understand the risk that may present um, in caregivers' behaviour, interventions with caregivers will only be effective with an additional understanding of the risks and strengths that also exist in a wider context at community and societal levels as well. So on the on the slide, you can see a figure which is taken from the report, which are the factors commonly associated with child maltreatment existing at the level of the child, family, community and society. Those factors that are that are in pink, which hopefully you can see if you can't, you can go and have a look at the figure in the report. Um, they're shown to in consistently increase the risk of child mal mal maltreatment. So domestic abuse, parental substance misuse and poor mental health that we've identified are three of the number of those risk factors to consistently increase child, the risk of child maltreatment at family level. However, you can see that there are a number of pink factors across all levels that we should be considering in our practice. And again, just to reiterate that the report makes it clear that these risk factors are not the cause of child maltreatment, but their presence increases the likelihood of it occurring. And so it's useful to view these factors as stressors to the family system, which have the potential to weaken that family system in a way that increases the risk of a child being harmed or their needs not being met. Next slide, please, Lisa. So in order to minimise risk to children, what we must do is build relationships and engage with children and every person who takes care of them. And obviously, Julie's already spoken to us a day, today about how we can do that. And that's the focus of today. So that includes mothers, fathers, grandparents and significant others involved in a child's life so that we understand the lived experience of the child and the family and the context of those presenting behaviours, working with all those people in that family system around that child to reduce the stresses on, on them and the system itself. This will in turn reduce the risk to the child. As individual practitioners, 
we cannot fix the whole system however much we'd often like to and structure around families but what we can do is be aware of the complex interaction of these factors the difficulties that families are experiencing but most importantly be aware of our own approach and how this impacts on on engagement which we've covered today we also need to make sure that we're using tools and resources available to us so You've started to do that by attending today's event, but also I'd encourage you to ensure you're familiar with the West Midlands multi-agency child protection procedures, particularly the Shropshire Thresholds document, as well as the local neglect, domestic abuse and substance mis -tool, misuse tools and pathways. Book yourself onto multi-agency training. Please visit the uh, safeguarding training page of the Shropshire Safeguarding Children's website. And also you may wish to read the early intervention early intervention foundation report that I've referred to, which is a really interesting report. It highlights over 50 interventions and activities with evidence of improving child and family outcomes within five categories of vulnerability. And it highlights where further work is needed to assess the effectiveness of those interventions. So I'd like to leave you at the end of my presentation today to watch this one minute video, which asks us to consider what makes a happy child. Thank you. It's coming shortly. A world without nature won't survive. Behind every happy child are adults who love and support them, even when things go wrong. Sometimes families need that support too. When we help families, we help children. However, some children can't stay with their family. For them, it's even more important we find adults to love and support them, to give them a second chance at a safe, secure and happy childhood. Our care system should set children up for life, allowing them to thrive and have a happy future. They say it takes a village to raise a child. We need to build that village with relationships as the foundation. It starts with love. To give all children the happy childhood they need, we need adults to surround families and children with love. Step up and be the change that social care needs. Step up for children. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Emma. And now I would like to hand over to Steve Cook. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Detective Inspector Steve Cook from West Mercia Police Statutory Major Crime Review Team, and I've been asked to come and give you some information on the Domestic Violence Disclosure Scheme, known as the DVDS. Thanks, Lisa. We will start with the um, the dreaded Mentimeter and the QR code, and I believe there's a link in the, uh, the chat function. If you can just answer this question, please. Have you ever supported anyone to use the domestic violence disclosure scheme? <clears throat> yeah, so there's a link in the chat or you can use the QR code on the screen. Just give us a nod, Lisa, when you think everybody's um, voted. Yeah, I'll share it on the screen for you. OK, thank you. So obviously today's will be relevant to some people. Some have. It would be interesting to know in the chat whether you've had good or bad experiences. That's lovely, thank you. Cheers, Lisa. So if we can start where it, it all began, really. Um, Claire's Law was named after Claire Wood, who was a 36 year old female who was murdered by her ex-boyfriend back in 2009, where she was strangled and set, set alight in a, home, in a home in Greater Manchester um, by her then partner, George Appleton, who had a record of violence against women. Um, Claire's father, Michael Brown, 
uh, cam campaigned on her behalf um, with regards to that if she knew his background, he believes that she would still be alive today. And with regards to domestic homicides, we have recently seen an increase within West Mercia, and I think nationally we have also um, with the, the rate of domestic homicides. Um, what the domestic um, violence disclosure scheme didn't do was give us any new legislation. It allowed the police to act on the, the common law power that we do have to disclose information where it's necessary to prevent crime. And obviously it provides us a structure and process to, us, to exercise those powers. Clearly, it does not in itself provide the power to disclose or prevent disclosures being made in situations that fall outside of this remit. Thanks, Lisa. Obviously, each request will be made on a case by case basis. So what is the domestic violence disclosure scheme? Like I said before, it's to give the public a formal mechanism to make inquiries about their partner if they're worried that they may have been in an abusive past. If police checks show that their partner has a record of abusive or violent behaviour, or if there's any other information to indicate they may be at risk from their partner, the police will consider sharing this information with them. But we only disclose this information as if it's lawful, necessary and proportionate to do so in the interest of protecting them and their children from harm. Thank you, Lisa. So we have two ways of doing it. It's the right to ask and the right to know. The right to ask is triggered by a member of the public and that can be any member of the public applying to the police for disclosure. Or well, the right to know, that can be triggered by us, us, the police, making a proactive decision to disclose information to protect a potential victim. Thank you, Lisa. So what is the right to ask? Who can ask for that disclosure? As I've said, anyone can make an application about their partner. It doesn't have to be about a, a specific reason or any specific, specific concern, or it could be a concerned third party, such as a parent, neighbour, such as anybody such as yourselves. However, a third party making an application would not necessarily receive the information about the partner. The information will only be given to someone who is in a position to use the information to protect that person from abuse. Thank you, Lisa. So what happens when somebody makes an application? Well, when the, when the person first calls the police, however that may be, we will take the initial details and do the, init, the initial risk assessments on that information. Um, clearly within the control room then, if it's believed that that person who's been identified is at immediate, immediate risk of harm, then clearly we won't wait for this process to be completed. Um, the police will act upon that information uh, and deploy units as necessary. Um, we will run initial checks on the information provided. Clearly, if a crime is also identified, then clearly that will be crimed as per Home Office guidelines and, and allocated to the, the relevant department. But most applications that do come into our control room don't need immediate action to be taken. They can take a number of weeks to reach, reach a conclusion. So with regards to the initial assessment, every stage of this process will require a, a risk assessment. So obviously to identify whether the criteria is met. Um, if the OCC supervisor believes that the criteria is met, that will then go to our perfect, protecting vulnerable people, PVP department, who then will begin the, the process where we will look at having a face to face meeting with the applicant. So whether that is the, um, the person themselves or the third party that's um, obviously reported it to us, we will speak to them. We will seek to basically make sure that they are who they say they are, so check their identity, and then get a full briefing and background history from them and what they know. And then from that information, um, a full risk assessment is then completed. That's obviously using the Police National Computer, the Police National Database, any advisor, any other systems that we use within the police. But also just as important is the, the multi-agency meetings or the conversations you have with the agencies, just to make sure that you are not aware of any information that we need to know to help us obviously get secure the safety of that person. What I will say is if an inquiry is made to a partner agency by somebody 
rather than the police. The normal procedures will be adopted by the partner agency for handling this type of information. However, if that person says that it is for domestic violence disclosure, then that should then be referred to the police and obviously then that process will start. What needs to be done is if when we have that meeting and that initial meeting with that person, um, we have to make sure that the initial contact is safe. Um, obviously, it's, it's confidential, um, but obviously understand and agree times for a meeting and a place. It might not be their home address. It might have to be somewhere else where we know that they're going to be safe. As I say, once all that multi-agency information is done and the full risk assessment is completed, then it goes to the detective inspector within that department to make the decision whether the information should be disclosed or not. And that's obviously that, that's when the process um, obviously goes to the next person. Thank you, Lisa. The next section is right to know. This is where we come in, 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 into uh, possession of information as professionals about a partner, we, we would consider that put somebody at the risk of harm and we may consider disclosing that information. The police and other re relevant partner agencies will help potential victims set up with a safety plan to provide, provide with help and support. So in essence, once we've got that information, then we would link in with our partner agents, agencies to, un to understand what we know about them and then devise a way that we are going to safeguard them, whether that means that the the person that the address needs to be arrested or they need to be safeguarded, but that safety plan would have to be um, obviously completed by us as the police and partner agencies. I think with the right to know, I think the earlier we do receive that information, especially if somebody's within a new relationship for the police, it's earlier the better and obviously for yourselves, because at some point over a few weeks when somebody's been in a relationship, they can become groomed and grained within that relationship. So it would be more difficult for us to get them out of that relationship and for obviously the information that we pass to them um, to cause them any issues. Thank you, Lisa. Obviously, the information that we do disclose, it is confidential within both processes. And the person that is disclosed to and not told to share the information with anyone unless they've spoken to the police or the person who gave them the information and they have agreed that it be shared Thank you, Lisa. The suggested timescales for all these processes, so with the right to ask, the initial contact and the initial checks should be completed within 24 hours. But clearly, if there is a significant information that somebody's at significant risk of harm, then we would act on within 24 hours. That step two, that face-to-face -face meeting, should be completed within 10 working days. And then the full risk assessment completed within five working days from that face to face meeting. I think the whole process now should take about 28 days in total, but obviously can take longer depending on circumstances. And the right to know indirect information received. We obviously intelligence checks are made and completed within five working days. Again, depending on that information, if somebody is at significant risk of harm, then we wouldn't wait those five working days. When we talk about referrals to local multi-agency forums, that can occur no later than 20 days from step three above, um, or when the intelligence checks are made under the right to know. But like I've said before, it's paramount that if somebody is identified as being at immediate risk of harm, then we wouldn't wait for this process. We'd act on the information received. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you for uh, agreeing to come today.